Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Thurshan Mehta. I'm the medical director of the Benson Henry Institute for Mind Body Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and the director of education for the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And it's really a pleasure to be with you uh, for this uh, very important dialogue around thinking about dietary supplements and cancer survivorship. Okay. So um, as we get started here, one, one of the important things I just wanted to highlight, the really two takeaway points from this presentation. One is that there's still a lot that we're learning about this topic around dietary supplements and cancer survivorship. And as I will show to you, there's really a, a body of evidence that is emerging, uh, but uh, quite frankly, it is limited. And, and as we gather more data and more research, we will also be able to understand more uh, what will be helpful for individuals with different, uh, uh, who, who are affected by different medical conditions. But the second and probably more important thing is that it's all very important to stay in communication with your healthcare provider around this, whether it's your oncologist, your primary care provider. Uh, and if you don't have that ability to do so, at least certainly finding a healthcare provider who is comfortable at least engaging in dialogue, helping you make the best decision possible for your health and well-being and, and being able to have that dialogue with you. So um, I'm going to take you through a brief history of medicine. Uh, and as you'll see here, uh, there, there are two individuals. There's the patient and the provider. And when we go back in time, uh, there was always this patient-provider dynamic. Uh, you see here, 2020 BC says, here, chew this root. And as we move forward in time, uh, you said that root is heathen, recite this prayer. And then we continue to move forward is that that prayer is superstition, sip this potion. And then we move into the advent of pharmaceuticals uh, and it goes that potion is snake juice, swallow this pill. And then even moving forward, uh, you go from pharma, particularly types of pharmaceuticals, particularly antibiotics. And we were at an era where antibiotics were being prescribed for so many things. And as you know, or as many of you know, uh, that has resulted in this uh, uh, challenge of having antibiotic resistance. And, and this in, the, in, the, in part was due to patient demanding or the, and, and the providers just uh, routinely dispensing antibiotics without sort of thinking about what it might be most effective for. And so this says that pill is ineffective, take this antibiotic. And then finally, it's interesting, what we've arrived back at is that that antibiotic is artificial here to this root. And I think part of it is uh, there's always this uh, dynamic and, and desire for patients to be engaged in their health and well-being, and they're doing everything possible. But if you look closely at these cartoons, one of the interesting dimensions of this is that patients will keep seeking when they're not feeling heard. Uh, and again, one of the most important things for uh, providers to understand, as well as patients, is that really engaging in a participatory dialogue where both individuals are looking at each other, both have something to bring to the table, and both are able to engage in rational dialogue. Now, I'm going to give you an example just from my own career as to how I got interested in this topic, uh, and, and then, but it really illustrated a certain uh, principles for me. Uh, I, this was, as a, as a general internist and I was in residency training, I had a, an individual who just came for depression, routine physical exam, and complained of mild knee pain associated with weight gain. Uh, and the family history is non-contributory, married, denied tobacco, alcohol, illicit drug use, and tend to eat a lot of fast food. Now, this type of patient would normally be sort of uh, celebrated in the clinic, saying, oh, wow, this is so easy. There's nothing to do here. Uh, but we, uh, she was actually very um, interested in discussing what to do about the knee pain. And, and historically, uh, what we would do for knee pain was to prescribe something, a medication, or say take some over-the-counter pain medicine and, and move on. We see here a uh, physical exam. She has an increased body mass index of 31, so some, just a mildly elevated blood pressure. And we find that uh, with patients, uh, this, uh, you know, we do sort of very 
uh, elementary diet and exercise counseling as providers oftentimes are diet counseling is telling patients to eat less and exercise counseling is saying, simply saying do more. But this individual asked me about something, uh, a dietary supplement that she came across, as well as a, this sort of um, brought in this magazine and it sort of illustrated this larger concept of, of integrative of medicine for me. So she said, like, Doc, what do you think? And she brought in this time issue as how your mind can heal your body. And again, this is often uh, one of these narratives, uh, again, it's a talk for another day, but where we think about like, you know, what is the mind-body connection here? And the other thing was she brought the supplement SAMI, which stands for s methionine. And she said, well, have you heard about this? Uh, and I went back to my uh, preceptor and asked her like, you know, what do I do with this patient? And my preceptor looked at me dumbfounded and said, how are you even, why are you even engaging in these discussions with your patients? Um, now, the interesting thing about when you look at every single dietary supplement, there are two things that you'll see in, uh, at the bottom of this box, uh, you'll see is that this product has not been approved or evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. Uh, and it's the other thing to treat any disease or, or for use in any sort of treatment. And the second thing it will say is that please talk to your healthcare provider before using. So I just wanna give some definitions. I think this is very important uh, for uh, everyone to understand uh, is when we uh, use certain words, what are we trying to mean by that? And I, I, I use the same uh, slide even with providers because sometimes words get mixed up and it often creates more barriers to having good dialogue. One is, uh, what is complementary? Com if it's a non-mainstream practice used together, conventional medicine is considered complementary. If it's a non-mainstream practice that's used in place of conventional medicine, that's often considered alternative. And if it is, uh, when we think of integrative, that, that means it's a holistic patient-focused approach to healthcare and wellness often including mental, emotional, functional, spiritual, social, and community aspects, treating the whole person. And it aims for well-coordinated care between providers and institutions. That is what we wanna to try to aim for here, is really think about integrative. And even dietary supplements fall into that broad rubric of integrative medicine. So again, I'm, I'm sh sharing these sort of bigger picture uh, uh, principles because then when we narrow it into thinking about uh, dietary supplements and how it applies, we want to have these principles in mind. One is how do we combine the best of both conventional and evidence-based complementary and alternative medicine therapies or integrated medicine therapies? How do we emphasize patient participation? And so how do you incorporate all of these things? One of the things that we will see, and I'll, as I'll show you some of the research, is that much of this really centers around the diet and how do we maximize positive aspects or health promoting dimensions of individual diets? How do we promote movement and exercise and obviously stress management in maximizing health? And as I said from the outset, this is really about the patient provider relationship. And again, even those cartoons highlighted why people keep seeking or may not even share with their provider is because they don't feel that their provider is listening to them. And so there's a sense of shared decision-making. The encounter itself, the encounter itself will contribute to the health and well-being of a patient. And what we are ultimately trying to do, and this is what survivorship is about, is seeking to optimize an individual's innate healing capacity. So we know that individuals use quite a bit of complementary integrative health approaches, one in three uses, and this has been pretty stable uh, over the past decade. Um, you know, children are also now a you know, significant amount of children. So it's very important, again, for individuals to communicate to their providers about their use of all complementary integrative health therapies. And it's also important for providers to be asking their patients about use of complementary and integrative health therapies. And uh, it's also important to note that individuals do spend a lot of money on this. Uh, when you look at natural product supplements here, you'll see that $12 billion, and this, these are 2012 numbers, 
uh, were spent on natural product supplements. Uh, and in, uh, you know, even children, um, it, again, uh, under a billion dollars was, was spent as well. So again, we know that there's a lot of discretionary income that is used to, uh, and uh, in of that natural product supplements and dietary supplements are a big component of that. And again, when we look at total healthcare spending, we see that again, while it is still relatively small relative to conventional care, it is a growing percentage of the amount of money that is spent uh, as it relates to total healthcare. What is important to recognize is that this is a significant out-of-pocket expense for many individuals as these products, dietary supplements are uh, particularly are not covered by, uh, typically covered by uh, healthcare insurance plans. And oftentimes, again, people will seek other types of healthcare professionals uh, both licensed and sometimes unlicensed or non-licensed healthcare providers to get advice around these complementary and integrative medicine practices, including what supplement should I use? And people are, are spending a lot of money. And, and some of you who are listening to this uh, discussion may also have spent uh, money uh, seeking advice from a healthcare provider that doesn't typically take um, insurance. So of all complementary healthcare approaches in adults, roughly one in five have used some sort of natural product in the past year. So again, this is a, a, a huge percentage in, in cancer uh, patient populations. We see that on the upwards of minimum of 20%, and some studies have shown up to even 80% of individuals have used some sort of natural product, which they feel it will benefit their own uh, health and well-being as it relates to the prevention, the treatment, as well as uh, as it relates to survivorship as well. And so equally also important to recognize that this is uh, across all ages and all, um, uh, and we see that particularly in the older uh, patient populations that tend to use more. Now that's uh, important to note simply because uh, these are individuals that often will have other medications and we have to pay attention to interactions as well. But we also important to note is that they're seen as highly prevalent and across all race and ethnicities as well. So when we think of the domains of integrative medicine, uh, as a, uh, and uh, all of these will incorporate, you, um, you'll see, um, approaches that sort of intersect or are uh, between these domains, but sort of roughly divided up uh, biologically based practices, which include herbal and dietary supplements, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail now, and diets. There's uh, energy therapies like healing and therapeutic touch and Reiki therapy, mind-body medicine like meditation, yoga, and Tai Chi, and manipulative and body-based practices like massage therapy and chiropractic care. Now, sometimes is uh, when, when you approach whole systems, like Ayurvedic medicine or traditional Chinese medicine, they have components of all of these. And one dimension is affected by the other. So for example, in Ayurveda, you may be prescribed a particular uh, type of dietary pattern uh, that is in accordance with your constitution or is part of your treatment, but then it may also incorporate yoga as well. Or in traditional Chinese medicine, there may be a prescription of Tai Chi, but with certain uh, traditional Chinese medicine supplements. So uh, I think it's important to now, let's talk about this a little bit in more detail um, of the biologically based practices. What is a dietary supplement? Well, what is interesting about the definition of a dietary supplement is that it was not made by uh, uh, healthcare providers. Um, uh, it was really a congressional definition in the United States. And uh, it's defined as containing one or more dietary ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, herbs, or other botanicals, amino acids, and other substances or their constituents. And you can see that this definition is quite broad. And that is why 
many dietary supplements can end up on the shelf uh, that are, can be purchased directly by the consumer as opposed to having to go through a healthcare provider to purchase it. Uh, and this was a political decision that was made. So it treats it more like food than it does like a pharmaceutical. And so when you go to a store, you will actually see many, the aisles, and this is even in the pharmacy, uh, like CVS or Walgreens, they, they typically have like two aisles that are full of now dietary supplements because one, is, it is quite lucrative. But second is that it is direct to consumer um, uh, sort of marketing and promotion rather than having to go through a healthcare provider. And again, as I mentioned, uh, a greater and greater uh, percentage of out-of-pocket dollars are spent on products, natural products and dietary supplements. Uh, and again, these are uh, uh, numbers from 2012. What is important to note is that one in five used dietary supplements in the past year. But also important to note is that nearly two thirds of individuals do not disclose use to their physician. And so one of the things to think about is how often have you shared with your provider of your use of an herbal and dietary supplement? Uh, and this is one of the most important things because if providers don't know, then they won't know how to even begin to advise you on its appropriateness or are there interactions that we need to be aware of as well. The list of dietary supplements that is, is, is it really driven economically. Uh, in 2002, for example, echinacea was the most popular one, but then there was this huge study in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that echinacea was not effective in the treatment of common cold. Uh, and then you can see it totally fell off in five years um, and it was no longer sort of the top one. And then it was fish oil and omega-3 fatty acids. So part of it is driven by sort of the, uh, you know, what is the latest buzz, but also that buzz can die pretty quickly. Now, what is imp important to note is that the studies can also be spun in a way that can really drive the, you know, marketing and, and promotion of particular dietary supplements. And so there's always sort of like the super supplement of the year, or you know this is the the, the best thing uh, since sliced bread and type of approach. Uh, and so it's very important to be careful about some of these claims that uh, are made. Again, it's not to say that they can't be studied, uh, but it's important to be appropriately critical and cautious, uh, and and really to have a rational approach to them. When we look at the different uh, cancers, uh, use of dietary supplements in different cancers, you'll see that uh, dietary supplements have been studied in many different types of, uh, of cancers, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, GI cancers, prostate cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, leukemia, head and neck cancer, and then many uh, a smattering studies and many, many other uh, types of um, uh, cancers. And again, you'll see that uh, many of the things that have been studied uh, don't fall into sort of the traditional categories of botanicals or vitamins or minerals, but sort of in the other. Uh, and sometimes there are uh, multiple products that are put into one sort of supplement. Uh, so it's sort of a proprietary blend, so to speak. So again, it's, it, it is quite confusing. Uh, and, and, and even for uh, healthcare providers to sort of make sense of, of the choices that are out there. And as, as some of you know, the choices are just uh, almost feel infinite in, in number. So let's go through a few of these just to give you a sense of where does the research lie. So when we look at multivitamins, uh, results, uh, just a general multivitamin, do they, do, should you be taking a general multivitamin? Turns out results have been all over the place. Uh, some of these big studies like the Physician's Health Study showed benefit. But then another big study, the Women's Health Initiative, showed no benefit. Some have shown benefits in specific cancer prevention, such as colorectal cancer. But in, in cancer survivors, in non-small cell lung cancer, a multivitamin showed benefit. But in breast cancer, it showed no benefit. Again, uh, what is interesting and hard to determine why the results have been all over the place is that, is it because of people who take 
a multivitamin also have a better lifestyle, meaning they have increased fruit and vegetable intake, or they tend to be more physically active. And I think that's one of the important things to take home is that there is going to be, there will never be a substitute for healthy lifestyle behaviors, which include having a healthy diet that is, you know, full of fresh fruits and vegetables uh, and whole grains uh, and the healthy oils. Uh, the things that we know that are true for cardiovascular disease, that includes, for example, the Mediterranean diet, uh, are true for any sort of cancer prevention as well as cancer survivorship. There is, again, will never be a substitute for movement. Having a healthy move, uh, healthy and sustained activity, again, uh, in cancer survivors, sometimes it's difficult because of the side effects of the chemotherapeutic agents. But having said that, uh, continue to stay uh, moving, uh, physically active, you know, thinking about aerobic exercise, strength training, and flexibility are important things to think about. And there will never be a substitute for that. Vitamin D, uh, again, another fascinating topic. Uh, when we think about it, there's been really wonderful studies that looked at, there's a tremendous association between the rate of cancer incidence and baseline levels of uh, vitamin D levels. So is you know, the higher the vitamin D level, the lower the cancer incidence, and these have been associations. In lung cancer, higher circulations of, of the, and the test that we often look at as a 25 hydroxy vitamin D is associated with improved survival. And again, these have to do with the circulating levels, but up until now, we have, don't know if that, if someone has a low and you supplement them, does that improve survival? It is still being looked at um, uh, and is still not clear. Now, the reason why we know that is that, is it because that people have higher circulation, they're actually getting vitamin D naturally, for example, through sunlight. Uh, and in order to have that, that means they're moving more. So these are, again, you can see the confounders come to uh, really play in terms of why are we seeing the results that we are. In colorectal cancer, there is a possible benefit with survival and higher circulating levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. But again, does supplementation help? We don't know. In breast cancer, it turns out it's an unclear relationship. There may be improvement in cyber higher levels, uh, but, but studies also have shown that supplementation does not seem to help. So there is one big prospective study underway called the vitamin D and omega-3 trial, and we will hopefully give us some more clarity around what is the role of vitamin D supplementation in overall cancer survivorship. Now. Uh, again, what we can safely say, you know, on average, it's, it does appear that baseline levels, circulating levels of your 25 hydroxy vitamin D is associated with improved survival. But does that mean that if you supplement and get there, does that also improve survival? And that's something that we are still trying to determine. Beta carotene, again, uh, uh, has been used as a supplement seen in many uh, foods, uh, such as carrots. Um, and other uh, uh, vegetables uh, and fruits and other antioxidants. Again, what we see is that when we supplement with uh, beta carotene, uh, there really is no benefit. And actually, uh, it, what's interesting that high doses of beta carotene may even be associated with an increased risk of lung cancer incidence, especially for smokers. Uh, they were uh, saying that smoking itself perhaps changes the beta carotene, oxidizes in a way that actually makes it a uh, promotes uh, uh, tumor development or progression, um, and and that that may be why that's we're observing that there was a study that was looking originally at supplementation beta carotene was stopped pre, uh, because of this uh, finding. But at the same time, we do know that increasing beta carotene intake through food is actually fine. It has not been associated with any sort of risk and anything again because of the increased. Uh, intake of fruit and vegetables, actually, it, it seems to be helpful. Another antioxidant, vitamin C, uh, used by many, many um, uh, individuals has been promoted, again, in very small, uh, in vitro studies or studies in the lab have found that, oh, there's a, uh, a, there are properties of it that actually are uh, helping fight or combat tumor genesis. 
and tumor progression. But when we look at it in real sort of in, the, in, in vivo or in real sort of, uh, human situations, we find that oral vitamin C doesn't seem to help at all. Maybe something with IV vitamin C infusion, the research in that area is quite limited. There are two small studies in pancreatic cancer that actually showed that when it was combined with chemotherapy agent, there was an increased survival. But these are very small studies. And you typically have to, uh, IV vitamin C infusion is not readily available in many uh, uh, spaces. Glutamine, again, uh, is an oral, the oral supplementation that's the amino acid seems to actually help with mucositis related to radiation head and neck cancer, as well as gut mucositis as well. And, and so that is, again, uh, another um, uh, antioxidant that uh, many people have looked at and, and take. Now, other botanicals, the bottom line, again, here is a very limited in, in evidence. Very few studies have looked at this in a, in a rigorous way. Um, so astra astragalus, which is uh, used in traditional Chinese medicine, it seems to increase the effectiveness in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, the effectiveness of chemotherapy. Uh, in colorectal cancer, ingestion of astragalus was associated with reduced neutropenia. Uh, another uh, supplement, melatonin, uh, we actually have seen that night shift workers have increased risk of breast and colon cancer. And again, that seems to be due to the disruption of our own endogenous or our own uh, internal production of mel melatonin. It does have to have benefit, appear to have benefits in cancer patients with solid tumors. Part of this is that when you improve the sleep regulation and does that help actually uh, promote uh, anti-tumor activity. Milk thistle, some of you have known, is, was popular for use in hepatic cirrhosis uh, and is sort of the associated hepatic uh, cancer, but very little data on it. And, and, and any, uh, up to this point uh, has, has really not shown from a uh, scientific perspective to actually help, uh, but it is very popular uh, uh, in sort of uh, in the lay public. Turmeric, again, some of you uh, I have uh, maybe very familiar with turmeric. Um, many trials are actually underway because of its uh, some of the th signs that we're seeing both in in the lab and in vitro studies, and as well as in animal studies, uh, and may be helpful in colorectal cancer, uh, prostate cancer, as well as radiation mucositis. Uh, what I typically, as a clinician, will allow uh, when, I, when I engage in discussions around turmeric uh, is to really invite patients to see how they can incorporate it in their cooking and in food. Uh, one of the things that we learn about botanicals is that part of the reason perhaps some of these studies have not been shown to be effective has been because plants are complicated and there are other compounds that need to be present in order for that particular uh, supplement to be effective. And so isolating just the curcumin, for example, in turmeric may not necessarily be effective, um, but may be better if it's taken in the context of uh, the food. Uh, ginger, we've seen many studies uh, now that have shown that has been helpful for chemotherapy-induced nausea. Now, as I mentioned, again, the challenges around botanicals is that they're derived from the whole plant, there are issues around sometimes pesticides and what is used, so we have to be uh, careful of that. Active constituents are often unknown. Now, as I mentioned from the get-go, the definition of dietary supplement was done by the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, treats herbs and dietary supplements more like foods and drugs. The government's responsibility is to prove products unsafe rather than on the pharmaceutical side where we have to prove safety. Labels are able to make structure function claims, but you can but they cannot make uh, labels to treat that say that it, this can treat and prevent disease. Now, uh, very smart marketers have been able to kind of find ways around this. So, for example, as the example I showed earlier, Sammy uh, can say that it can be used to uh, for joint support as a structure, but not used to treat osteoarthritis. And the challenge here is there's no legal or regulatory definition of standardization in the United States. The FDA had a rule um, uh, fine in 2007 that uh, basically said, um, uh, finally, uh, that it requires proper controls to ensure that dietary supplements are processed in a consistent manner to 
for identity, purity, strength, and composition. It meets quality standards. And this, again, applies to both domestic and foreign companies. However, the uh, FDA is very uh, stretched. Uh, and so the, the ability to actually help manage and uh, regulate this is quite limited. And there are third party entities that help uh, evaluate the quality and safety of dietary supplements. These are three labels that you will see, Consumer Lab, uh, United States Pharmacopeia, and the NSF or National Sanitary Foundation. They confirm an, the identity and quantity of ingredients declared on the label. It is uh, these entities look uh, at the product and, and determine if they're free of, examine the product and determine if they're free of contaminants. They demonstrate the conformance to industry good manufacturing practices and there's ongoing monitoring. Now, one of the interesting areas I just will point out for many survivors is issues around pain and pain management. And again, uh, the challenge in the literature has been thus far is that people, while don't recognize, and, and this is the struggle with the patient in their interaction with the providers that we often focus on pharmaceuticals. So this is a recent New England journal. And even when we look at pain management here, all the options for pain management are often seen as pharmacological options. And, and that's becomes challenging. And people are seeking these other options. And so one of the things, again, to be really cognizant of uh, as both as patients, but as, as providers is how do we actually uh, help, uh, uh, help each other? How do we actually, again, understand the evidence and then ultimately obtain or return to a rational perspective on what will make sense for me? So where do you turn to for evidence-based information? And there are uh, many resources now out there. Uh, here's some examples. There's Natural Standard and the Natural Medicine Comprehensive Database, Consumer Labs, uh, again, providers, many of the providers will have access to these resources. And if you don't, they're very, um, uh, they've done very high quality monographs on various dietary supplements that, uh, uh, and, and also help some of these websites help identify brands that are actually say, actually contain what they, uh, say they contain. Now, to, this is, again, to the degree that someone can state that is often also challenging because we don't necessarily know what the active ingredients are. Uh, the, at the National Institutes of Health, uh, they also have resource, resource available and then their academic medical centers that, uh, uh, as well as the Society for Integrative Oncology, have put out resources around uh, how to find, how to ask the right questions. Uh, in our centers, you know, we serve as a resource for both patients and providers to help answer some of these questions, uh, both at the Brigham and at MGH. Now, in sort of conclusion, the question will always be, should something be recommended, tolerated, or avoided? Again, if we have evidence of efficacy and evidence of safety, it's, it's very easy to recommend and monitor. But most things fall in the next two categories, which is that there may be inconclusive evidence of efficacy, and some evidence and evidence of safety. So you, again, what I, when I work with my colleagues is like, you know, how can we accept that and then monitor if there is a desire for the patient to use something. In terms of if something has high evidence of efficacy but safety is not clear, then it's, again, tolerate monitor. And obviously anything that is shown to be disproven or unsafe, we should, you know, be actively avoiding and, and discouraging use. Ultimately, this is balanced around what is the individual preference. So we're balancing these domains of quality, safety, and efficacy around individual preference. Now, I think just in the last sort of concluding thought is that ultimately what I hope patients uh, ultimately should not feel afraid to talk to their providers about it, and providers also in, uh, reciprocally should not feel afraid of their patients asking them questions about it we have the ability to now think about these, uh, some of these uh, uh, dietary supplements and botanicals more critically. Um, and so we can engage in very, uh, by, uh, engage in dialogue that's di respectful, bi-directional and help ultimately make the best decision possible for individual health and well-being. So uh, this is sometimes the old picture of the provider 
uh, getting upset with the patient, but I, what I really firmly believe is that there's no need to be afraid. And we can, again, make these decisions in very thoughtful and rational ways. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with all of you and uh, uh, we'll, we'll finish this uh, presentation here. <laughs>